The Portuguese capital, Lisbon, lies on the western Iberia Peninsula, where the Tagus River meets the Atlantic Ocean. Settled almost 3,000 years ago, the city predates Rome, Paris and London by centuries and possesses an epic narrative to match. From its early days as a Phoenician outpost, to its expansion into a 16th century trading giant, from the Great Earthquake of 1755 to its glorious reconstruction, Lisbon has long been a city of shifting fortunes. For much of the 20th century, the city floundered, but the winds of fate have again shifted in Lisbon's favor. No longer a place of faded glory, 21st century Lisbon is again a place of possibilities. This is a city whose journey has forever been tied to the sea. So it's not surprising that many of her most important landmarks can be found along the waterfront. Rising from the banks of the Tagus River, the fortified elegance of the Torre de Belém stands as a reminder of Portuguese prestige and power in days of old. Just up river rises the Monument of the Discoveries, which celebrates the nation's most revered seafarers, such as Prince Henry the Navigator, Vasco da Gama and Ferdinand Magellan. Climb to the rooftop and look down upon the Mapa Mundi below, which charts the routes and discoveries of Portugal's intrepid mariners. Nearby, continue your voyage into Lisbon's seafaring past at the Jerónimos Monastery. Vasco da Gama spent his last night in prayer on this site before departing on his epic voyage to the Orient in 1497. The vast monastery that stands today was funded by the incredible wealth that the Gamma's spice route brought to the city. This vast monastery complex is also home to the city's maritime museum, which preserves relics from Portugal's golden age of sail. In the early 1800s, Portugal's rulers forced the resident monks to vacate their beloved monastery. Destitute, the monks sold a prized possession, their secret egg tart recipe. Five generations later, the neighboring Belém patisserie serves over 20,000 pastéis de nata to sweet tooth devotees each day. And the recipe remains a guarded secret to this day. Once you've stocked up to the world's finest pastel de nata, set sail to the newest horizon in creativity at the Museum of Art, Architecture and Technology. Further upriver, the Portuguese love of the sea continues at the city's acclaimed Oceanario where hundreds of species glide by in a celebration of a global ocean. From here, climb aboard the cable car and glide up river again for bird's eye views of the city and the 11 mile long Ponte Vasco da Gama, the longest bridge in Europe. The waterfront is also where you'll find the city's grand gateway. Praça do Comércio. This great square in the center of the Baixa district was once the home of the royal palace until 1755 when a natural disaster changed Lisbon in Europe forever. At the Lisbon Story Center, feel the devastating tremors of that six minute earthquake and the terror of the tsunami and five day firestorm that followed. The earthquake obliterated 85% of the city. But with calamity came opportunity. Within a year, the rebuilding of Lisbon was well underway. Wide avenues replaced the medieval rabbit warrens of old, 
and a new style of elegant, earthquake-resistant architecture was born, Pombalin. The earthquake also shook the city free from the religious dogma of old, and from its cracks came the fresh new shoots of the Enlightenment. Passed beneath the triumphal arch, crowned with a figure of glory, valor and genius, a tribute to the city's swift reconstruction. Then, simply drift down Rua Augusta and into another of Lisbon's great squares, the Rocio. If Praça do Comércio is the city's gateway, the Rocio is its heart. Since the Middle Ages, Lisbon's citizens have gathered here for pool fighting and celebrations. Today, it's the perfect place to relax by the cool of its fountains and on the waves of its patterned pavement. Lisbon belongs to that club of great cities, which are defined by seven hills. So, wherever you roam, eventually you will find yourself going up to take in the views. Luckily, Lisboetas have come up with some innovative solutions to save their legs on hot summer days. From the lower town, ride the Elevador de Santa Justa to the Bairro Alto district. Here, you will find the Convento do Carmo, whose unrestored arches bear testament to the devastation which befell the city in 1755. Climb aboard the Tram 28, which passes some of the city's most iconic sites. Then, from Portas do Sol, make the climb to Castle of St. George. From high on the battlements of this 11th century Moorish citadel, the red tiled roofs of Lisbon spread out before you, stepping down to the lower town and the blue takers beyond. You'll find trams rattling all over Lisbon, but the most beloved of all is Gloria, which runs between the lower town and Miradouro de São Pedro de Alcântara, the perfect place to watch the city light up with someone special. Although the great earthquake reduced much of Lisbon to rubble and ash, the ancient suburb of Alfama was spared. Lose yourself amid the ancient cobblestones and steps, where cafes, bars and artisan shops have taken residence in the dock workers' homes of old. Yet, the area still retains its village atmosphere, especially during the midsummer festivals, when over 50 street parties pop up all over the city. The Alfama is home to the Romanesque towers of Lisbon's cathedral, whose walls date back to the Second Crusade, when the city was liberated from the Moors. If the stones of Alfama could sing, then surely it would be the bittersweet lament of the Fado. At the Fado Museum, discover the traditional song of Portugal, which originated in the bars and laneways of the Alfama. Then, as the sun gets low, join locals in a Fado bar and listen as professional and up-and-coming Fadistas sing the heart-rending stories of the working class and the sea. Lisbon's walls may not sing, but the tiles which adorn them possess a music of their own. First introduced by the Arabs, over the centuries the Portuguese have made the art of azulejo their own. Housed in a former convent, the National Azulejo Museum celebrates the evolution of Portugal's tile craft across the centuries. From the biblical tales of old to the new frontiers of tile design. You'll find azulejo at every turn in Lisbon, from the practical to the purely decorative. But to see the Sistine Chapel of Tiles 
have to the city's north, to Fronteira Palace. Just to the east, at the Kaldust Gulbenkian Museum, you'll find another of the world's great collections. The museum's 6,000 art treasures represent a lifetime of acquisitions by the oil magnate Gulbenkian. Lisbon's love of creativity isn't just confined to her galleries. You'll find it amid urban renewal projects like the LX Factory, which has breathed new life into the city's fabric factories, which fell silent long ago. You'll find creativity on the communal tables of the Mercado da Ribeira, where some of the city's most innovative chefs and brewers reinterpret age-old traditions. Lisbon has always been a city of discovery, so when you're ready to explore a little further afield, you'll find no end of adventure. Less than 20 miles west of the city is Cascais, an ancient fishing village that was woken from its slumber when Lisbon's nobility discovered its golden bays in the late 1800s. Another playground for Portugal's monarchs was Sintra, the home of the Summer Palace. A half-hour drive to the northwest of Lisbon, Sintra is more than a weekend destination. It's a journey into a fairy tale. Hans Christian Andersen fell under Sintra's spell, returning time and time again, calling it the most beautiful place in Portugal. From Sintra, it's just a short drive to the incredible coastline of the Sintra Cascais Natural Park. Spend a few days exploring some of Europe's most beautiful beaches, such as Praia das Maçãs. Named after the apples which floated downriver from the nearby orchards and washed up upon its sands. From here, venture southward and explore the remote beaches of Adraga and Ursa where the Atlantic waves have carved a dramatic coastline straight from Homer's Odyssey. At Cape Roca, stand upon the cliff top, which until the 14th century was considered the end of the world. Here, on the westernmost point in mainland Europe, 400 feet above the pounding Atlantic, it's easy to understand how Lisbon's seafarers were drawn to see what lay over those far horizons. Yet, no matter what wonders they saw, what riches they found, they always yearned to return to their city, Lisbon, the Queen of the Seas.